uh, stand in pride before you or others or in arrogance. We humble ourselves before you because of who you are, Lord. And we recognize that you are the head of the body. And that's how we know you as the head of the body, as the resurrected, ascended, seated Lord of glory. We praise you, Father God. We ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts, teach us, guide us, and direct us. And uh, as Gary's reading his poetry this morning, let that be uh, to your honor and to your glory as well. Let it be um, a blessing to the body of Christ and uh, the sermon that Osiris is going to preach, the sermon that my wife is going to preach later today in Chinese, and also Gary's poetry this morning. Let it be edifying to the body of Christ, Lord, that we may come together as one and worship in praise of you and recognize who you are and all the amazing things you have, have done for us and the things that you are yet to do. We do praise you and worship you and adore you this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we do praise you and thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Osiris, I've got you as the host. Uh, can you check to make sure the recording is on? Oh, yeah, it is recording. Okay. Yeah, all I right. think it's recording, yep. Okay. All right, so Gary, you're all set to, to uh, with your poetry. Okay, I got two poems today. One of them is called I Am a Homosexual. And the other one's called Monitored Freedom. And when it comes to people judging somebody, doesn't Paul say in Corinthians, he that is spiritual judges all things, but he himself is judged of no man. Amen. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. And this one's called I am a homosexual. I am a homosexual. You must defend my right to perform these lewd and vile acts condemned by Jesus Christ. The Bible's very clear, sodomy is a sin. So the LGBT crowd must repent and give in. I am a homosexual and I deplore hate speech, which applies to anyone who with our doctrine disagrees. Society has slowly become degenerate, forgetting what God teaches, which is why we're in this mess. I am a homosexual depraved and condemned by the holy scriptures given by God to men. Mankind has lost its mind. It now crawls in the dirt, forgetting only heterosexuals are able to give birth. I am a homosexual hiding what's inside. More often than not, I'm contemplating suicide. The pressure on me multiplies each day. I wish there was a way out. I'm unhappy being gay. I am a homosexual. In truth, I am ashamed. I think I might ask Jesus, is it possible to change? All my friends are homosexual. If I left, I'd be alone. But the pain that's in my heart tells me to make it known. I am a homosexual, severely depressed. I finally had the guts to get this off my chest. I am a homosexual. You must defend my right to perform these lewd and vile acts condemned by Jesus Christ. I'm not a homosexual. They are children of the devil. I say this out of love to those who proclaim I am a homosexual. Okay, and the next one's called Monitored Freedom. Freedom to sit, freedom to stand, but has freedom in America retreated or advanced? Dial the landline, you're being monitored on the computer or cell phone, a government sovereign. Is monitored freedom really freedom at all? You're monitored on the street at schools and the malls, at the mall shopping, on the bus, on a plane. They're videotaping the crowd at the game. Policemen wear cameras, soon we'll wear chips embedded in our bodies. Is, that, is this what freedom is? Why do the neighbors act like Jane and James Bond? Spying is normal when man becomes God. What about GPS, satellites in the sky? I was being monitored when I bought a burger and fries. Banks, ATMs, parking garages, at social events, they even bug corsages. We're the land of the monitor, the home of surveillance information on us there's pages and pages agencies exist all day all they do is listen and watch what you say and choose of course they'll deny it we're betting we're being set up to a liar listen closely the truth is corrupt so get a nice haircut as often as possible smile you're on candid camera the picture is going on file your voice recordings wiretaps audio tapes are pretty sophisticated for glorified apes. Freedom is bound, changed up by government, chained up by government, shackled, you know why? Freedom must be monitored. 
That's it. Okay. All right. Hey, Amen. Uh, real quick, uh, Osiris, I, I want to uh, give a welcome. There's a little bit more, a uh, couple of people who've never been here before. Uh, so I wanted to give a welcome to anyone who is, is their first time uh, at our at our uh, at our fellowship. Uh, I saw someone named Alonzo on there and Norma. So uh, welcome. And uh, if you have any questions, we have a, a question session after the sermon, uh, which will allow you to ask any questions. That, so, that's Alonzo and Norma. Yes, sir. Um this is me. I was finally got the chance to tune in. You know, the, the timing over here is a couple hours before, so it's kind of hard to catch up with you guys sometimes. Oh, welcome, but, welcome. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you. And uh, I, I was waiting to speak earlier with the prayer request. It doesn't have to be now, but uh, I had recently had uh, COVID. So um, now I'm still like in recovery process, but I still haven't got my taste and my smell back. We'll be praying for you, brother. We'll lift you up for sure. We're definitely keeping in prayer, Alonzo. But yeah, it's all good. It's good to hear from you guys and see you guys again. Bless, blessing to hear from you, brother. Okay. And uh, is that Norma? Uh, yeah, that's our Norma. Oh, yeah, Norma. Norma. Okay. Hey, Norma, how you doing? I don't know if her sound's on. Uh, okay. And so, all right. And so, was there also? So, but it's good to see you, hon. Norma, hello, Sibwa. Amen. Good to see everybody. Amen. All right, so let me go ahead and turn it over to Osiris. Okay. Everybody can see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, guys, this here. is gonna be first foundational footing number 11. <clears throat> um, can you hear it? Yes, we're good. So this is number 11 of a 12 part series. We're coming towards the end here um, of this first part of the series. Um, today's title of the series is Total Security, uh, which kind of fits well with today. Today is Resurrection Sunday, um, April 4th, 2021. So this is the date that we're actually uh, giving this lesson live. So happy Resurrection Sunday to everybody uh, that's listening to it on this day. So our objective for today is I can explain how we have total security in Jesus Christ. Just a little quick review. Uh, last time we discussed how to deal with sin as a believer, uh, and we learned the following. There are three methods of intervention God used, um, used by God, the Holy Spirit, to help us not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, number one is direct intervention, and that's done by the word of God or the doctrine is stored in your soul. Uh, as noted in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, and Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Number two is indirect intervention. And that's still the word of God, but it's the word of God being ministered to you through the confrontation or interaction of other believers. So other believers sharing the word of God with you, um, as opposed to you in the word of God, just reading it directly uh, yourself. And that's found in Colossians chapter one, verse 28 and Galatians chapter six, verse one. And then there's number three, there's the natural consequences of sin also known as self-induced misery, and that's the whole, you reap what you sow. Um, and so let's talk about in Galatians chapter six, verse seven and eight. Then we get access to God by faith, as noted in Romans 5, 1. We walk in the spirit by faith, as noted in Colossians chapter two, verse six and seven, and Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. And we are under the system of grace um, as opposed to being under the system of, of the law, which is noted in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. So there are three issues uh, in regards to justification. And uh, just a reminder, 
Uh, that word justification means to be declared righteous, uh, to be declared right, uh, to get that basar, that perfect righteousness that we get um, in Jesus Christ. Um, so number one, the penalty of sin uh, is paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, as noted in Romans 3.25. So remember that word blood in this passage signifies the fact that Christ didn't just die, but that he died as a sacrifice for our sins. Uh, God poured his wrath out against our sins on Jesus Christ at the cross, and Christ paid the price for our sins completely, and for the sins of the whole world, for that matter, uh, completely. And that's what that word propitiation means. It means to satisfy the justice of God. So if you remember, uh, there's none righteous, so we're all unrighteous and lack God's righteousness, which means that uh, God's justice qualifies us uh, for death. And so Jesus Christ dies our death. He takes on the payment for our sins, um, and his sacrifice uh, satisfied the justice of God, and that's propitiation, okay? So, you know, sometimes people will hear about a really bad person or someone that they consider is not worthy of salvation, and they'll say, how can that person get to get saved? And um, if you want to answer that question for them, you can help them understand that that the sins that that person committed uh, are not being overlooked by God. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ actually took on the punishment for those sins, and he paid the price for those sins. And then that person put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was given that person righteousness in Christ. And so that then qualified that person to have eternal life. So they will someday either be changed if they live until the Lord returns, and given a resurrection body, or they will be resurrected in glory, um, as we all will be if we don't live until the Lord's return. Number two, justification applies to those who believe, as I just mentioned. So in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 22, it reads, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, so it's, uh, it's available uh, for all, and upon all um, them that believe. So it's available to all and all that believe get it. Okay. Uh, so Christ died for all mankind. That's that unto all. He, he died for everybody. He paid for all the sins of the world. So salvation is available for all. Um, but it only applies to those who receive the free gift by faith. It's upon all that believe. Upon or imputation to add to one's account, we lack the righteousness of God, need to qualify for eternal life, but in Christ, God imputes or adds that righteousness to us. Okay? And then number three, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was raised for our justification, which is again very fitting for the day that this lesson is being uh, recorded because it is Resurrection Sunday. So, you know, this is the time that we really celebrate Although, you know, many of us are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ every day, you know, as we're thinking about the fact the relationship that we have with God and the power that he's given us um, over our oaths and natures and the nature that we have in Christ. And we know that all that is available because Jesus Christ died for our sins. He didn't just die, but that he proved that he paid the price for our sins through his resurrection. And so Romans chapter 4, verse 25 kind of talks a little bit about that. And res resurrection signifies a complete payment sin. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but because Christ paid for all sins and uh, he had no sin of his own, there was no sin left to hold him in death. So he was free to be resurrected and resurrected in glory. So think of resurrection as a receipt for a paid transaction. Okay, so resurrection is the proof that uh, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. I think Paul said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that if Jesus Christ didn't resurrect from the grave, then our faith is in vain. And, uh, you know, we are then most miserable. If all we have is this life to look forward to. So we are promised a resurrection like the Lord Jesus Christ, um, a resurrection in glory. Um, because, uh, and that'll happen when the Lord returns um, to take the body of Christ. And if we're still alive at that time when that happens, then, uh, we will just be changed to our body of glory, as he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
So that's something to celebrate. That's something to be uh, happy about and to rejoice in and that hope. So, you know, whenever things get bad and you think about how bad things might get, just think about the, the future resurrection or that future change into glory uh, that we look forward to too, and look forward to having and living for eternity uh, without sin, without, you know, pain, suffering, without getting older or die, worrying about dying. Um, we have that future glory uh, to look forward to. Okay, so <clears throat> the security that we have in Jesus Christ. And we're going to be taking a look at Romans chapter 5 today. Um, the first five verses we're going to be focusing on uh, in Romans chapter 5. Uh, so in Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 1, uh, 1 through 5, uh, it reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And that's Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. And really the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5 are the greatest passages um, on a believer's security in the Bible. The chapter begins with the word, therefore. And because we have been justified in Jesus Christ, we now understand a few things about what we have in him. Okay, so here's some important things uh, to point out um, for the first three verses in chapter 5 of Romans. <clears throat> we have peace with God, <clears throat> as noted in Romans chapter uh, 5, verse 1. We have access to God, as noted in verse 2 of chapter 5. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, uh, as noted in Romans chapter 5, verse 2 also. And we glory in tribulations, uh, as noted in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. So, so we have peace with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, peace can be defined as an absence of strife. Um, God no longer deals with us on the basis of wrath anymore. Um, we have absolute perfect standing with God through Christ's redemptive work. As noted in Romans chapter 2, verse 8, uh, God uh, mentions that God's indignation and wrath. Okay. So, you know, Romans starts out talking about the wrath of God that's coming um, on sin. And Sin is a reason for God's wrath, as noted in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, 6 also. And anyone that minimizes the wrath of God minimizes the grace of God, because the first issue Paul addresses when describing God's grace is God's wrath and attitude against sin. So, you know, that first whole chapter of Romans. And when Paul says we have peace with God, he's not just saying that there is a ceasing of hostility, which is waiting to break out at any moment. You know, how sometimes like nations will go to war. And, uh, you know, they'll declare peace, but there's still like this hostility between them. Uh, you know, that if any one little thing changes, they can be right back at that fighting again, that, that the hostility will break back out. But that's not that's not the way it is with you and I and our relationship with God. Um, it's a total settlement of the issue. The resurrection is a receipt mark paid in full. The beef that God's justice has with us because of our sin is settled. It's paid for, paid in full. There is no longer any issue. The consequences for sin is never an issue before God again. And that's why right now in this current time, God is not pouring out <clears throat> his wrath 
and he has the ability to delay his future wrath uh, because of this issue. And if you take a look at Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 to 14, you kind of get some more passages to kind of talks about the fact that when Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he paid for the complete and total shebang. He paid the whole thing. He took care of it all. He paid for all sins. Okay. We also have access to God. Um, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. We have a pathway, access to God by faith. And um, there's kind of two important issues about access. Number one, there's a dispensational change. In time past, the only the high priest had access to God once a year, and he had to come with the prescribed sacrifice as described in uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1 to 34. The veil in the temple was there to stop people from getting access to God. Um, and if they went to the holiest of holies in an unclean manner, then they would die. They just dropped dead. Like You couldn't just come past that veil without coming the way God said to come, wearing the right clothes, bringing the right sacrifice. You step up in there and you're done. You just, you just drop and die. And that, of course, happened to a couple of Aaron's sons, and they had to be dragged out of there by somebody because they didn't come the right way. And you, you can see that in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 7. Um, people came to the temple with sacrifices, and the temple was where the Spirit of God was. And when they prayed, they prayed towards the temple. Um, in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel opens up his window, and he prays towards Jerusalem where the temple was. We don't have to go to a temple to pray. We are the temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, it reads, What? Know ye not? And here again, he's always saying stuff like that. Don't you know? You start to get the hint when you read a lot of these passages that God expects you to know some things. He doesn't want you just walking around ignorant of who he is, who you are, and what you are in Christ Jesus. He wants you to know some things. That's why you have to study to show yourself approved in the God, 2 Timothy 2.15, by dividing the word truth so that you can have this knowledge and know who and what you are. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Again, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 and 20. Uh, people didn't have access to God like we have today. But this is not really the issue in Romans chapter 5. Number two, there's something more basic involved when he talks about access. We are justified and have access to this grace where we stand. We are firmly standing irremovable. We can't be moved. <clears throat> if you notice back in Colossians chapter 2 verse 7, he talks about being rooted and built up in him. We talked about the fact that the roots are what hold the tree in place. The roots are also what are the pathways for nourishment <clears throat> to that tree too as well. <clears throat> we have a complete, perfect standing in Jesus Christ. We have complete forgiveness, deliverance, and redemption. As noted in Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and 26, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. We're not on probation. This standing is not probationary. God is free to deal with us in a positive manner. We have free access into this grace where we stand, and we have it by faith. That's how we take advantage of it and utilize it. We make it a living reality, an experiential reality, by faith. By just believing is true because God's word says so. When we sin, we don't work to try to get right with God. Instead, we recognize our faults and then we recall the fact that we are already forgiven and that we have access to God. We don't have to continually seek God's favor through religious activities.
in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it talks about our security and how we can deal with sin as a justified person in permanent, favorable relationship with the justice of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't deal with sin as a partially justified person, but as a completely justified person. We never get out of fellowship with God. You might act in a manner that is not in line with who you are in Christ, but God never closes the door between you and him. You have an eternally fixed, favorable relationship with Christ and with God. <clears throat> Recognize what sin is and who you are in Christ. The purpose of the gospel was to call you into the fellowship of his son, as noted in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. And if you were to lose that, you would perish in the lake of fire. Our standing is fixed, and that's security. We have security based on the fact that the justice of God was satisfied by the sacrifice at the cross, as noted in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And at the moment of faith in the gospel, we are placed into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look real quick at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 and 14. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, it reads that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, and ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. We don't feel it. We know it because of faith. God's word says it's so. So what about fall from grace? As he mentions over in Galatians chapter four, chapter 5, verse 4, uh, he says, Christ has become of no, no effect unto you, whosoever are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. These folks were said to have fallen away from the grace principle of salvation and place themselves under the law. The law says, keep the commandment and you get the blessing. Grace says, here's the blessings for free up front. Falling from grace, it's not a loss of salvation, but rather it's a moving away by the individual from the system of grace to a system of the law. Next, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 2. Hope. This word means an eager anticipation of a sure thing. You are positively sure it's going to happen. Now, compare Romans 5, 2, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. With Romans 3, 23, come short of the glory of God. Our status has changed in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not only going to enter into God's glory someday, we are also going to share and reflect that glory to others. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verse 10. <clears throat> our testimony on earth during the dispensation of grace and suffering will affect that glory. In Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 17 and 18, <clears throat> and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, uh, it reads in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in us. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it reads, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh the force of far more exceeding and internal way to glory. Paul calls the suffering that we experience while we're here on, on earth still light affliction. And Paul had some suffering. You know, in chapter 12, second, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, he talks about some of the horrible things that he went through, being stoned and being left out in the sea and people trying to kill him every day. And, and he calls all that light affliction compared to the glory 
that will be revealed in us someday. You know, sometimes when we're going through a hardship, it's hard to think about anything but what's going on at that present time. And sometimes you have to step back and look at things in light of the big picture. And when you look at things in light of the big picture, you realize that our life now here on Earth is just a small fraction of the total totality of our whole entire life. Because even if we die and we don't live until the Lord returns, we will be resurrected to glory. And we're going to live for eternity, forever, forever. Our life's never going to end from that point forward. So this little time that we had where there was some suffering, when you compare that to an eternity of glory, that's what Paul's saying. You can't compare it. God will reward us for the suffering we go through here on earth. At the moment of salvation, God could have just changed us, given us a resurrection, spiritual, heavenly body, and taken us up to heaven. But he left us here to serve him. And while we are here, we can and will suffer, and God will reward us for having to be left here. We have peace with God because the penalty of sin was paid. We have access to God in the grace where we now stand because the power of sin has been broken. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because the presence of sin will one day be removed. We have salvation from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. Amen. And because of this, we glory in tribulation. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing, here it is again, we know something, that tribulation worketh patience. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Not only do we rejoice in the, in the glory of God. But justification qualifies us to rejoice in the present troubles now. Justification doesn't just qualify you for the future. It equips you for right now. Romans 5, 3, knowing we know something about what God is doing today and how he is dealing with us that changes our perception about tribulation in life. Tribulation or trouble works patience. There's never any growth without pressure or obstacles or pain. Justification gives you peace with God, but it can't give you patience. Trouble does. Peace, patience can be described as peace under pressure or steadfastness. Tribulation tries your faith, as noted in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, and reliance on God's word, how you're going to respond to the details of your life. What are you going to rely on? The trying of faith produces patience. When you have trouble and you handle it correctly like a justified person, then it produces patience. No sane person glorifies in trouble for trouble's sake. We look at the problems and can see them for what they really are. We know because of our justification that God can take those problems and cause them to produce positive results in our life. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, Peter talks about the difference of suffering for Christ's sake and for the sake of your sins. But in Romans chapter 5, Paul doesn't make a difference, which means that God can take bad things in your life, even things that have come as a result of sin, and when handled correctly, he can work those things out for good. As noted in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, verse 3, 4, and 5 of Romans chapter 5. Bring us to the point where we can appreciate the way God loves us in a way we could never appreciate it before. Love, in this, in this, in this place, Gopi love is talking about, is a mental attitude of value and esteem. When tribulation works patience, we're learning how much God values and esteems us. We possess the Holy Spirit. He has given to us, and he has a purpose. And when tribulation comes, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God in your soul your inner man, and he uses it to strengthen you. 
As noted in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it reads, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Tribulation makes you depend on the word of God. God comforts you in tribulation so you can be equipped to help somebody else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it reads, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God further equips us to honor and glorify him. God not only rewards you for pain and suffering you endure here, he also rewards you for leaving you here on earth. The nature of the dispensation of grace says, human flesh, human strength, human ability is of no value to God, death to the flesh. You know this, so when those infirmities come and you are strong, but look weak so that God can get the credit. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and in reproaches, and in necessities, and in persecutions, and in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. So in light of Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to read the passage um, on resurrection and found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, verses 42, all the way to the end of the chapter. So starting in verse 42, uh, Paul talking about the resurrection and how it's going to be like when people are resurrected and answering that question. He talks about there's different types of bodies, there's the bodies, the sun has a type of body, the stars have a type of body, animals have different types of bodies, and so is the resurrection. In the resurrection, we will also have a different type of body. So starting in verse 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42 to 49. In verse 50, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always bounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to 58. In this lesson, we discussed our total security in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We learned the following. 
Three issues with regards to justification. The penalty is paid for by the blood of Christ, Romans 3.25. Justification applies to those who believe, Romans 3.22. He was raised for our justification, Romans 4.25. Our security in Christ. We have peace with God, Romans 5.1. And that's a peace that lasts forever. Not a peace that's where there's about to be some hostility to break out. We're always in a perfect standing with God. We have access to God, Romans 5.2. That means we're unremovable. We cannot be removed from our access to God. We always have access to God no matter what. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, Romans 5, 2. That is that someday God will use us to glorify himself. And we glory in tribulations, Romans 5, 3. That is that even when bad things happen, God is able to take those bad things and work them out for our good. Keep you. Next time, we'll discuss our reconciliation with God. So we're going to take a look at uh, the word reconciliation and how it applies to our salvation. Before we close, as always, we're going to take a look at the gospel. Um, I know that just about everybody that's here on the live uh, session of this it, knows the gospel and believes in the saved, but just in case anybody's watching this video on YouTube or a friend is passing on to you and you're not sure how to be saved and you're not sure about the salvation, uh, let's take a look at the gospel of the good news um, as presented in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, what do you need to do? You need to just believe what God believes. That is, that when Jesus Christ died, he died to pay for everything that is wrong with you, and that what he did is enough. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. God just wants to look down on your heart, on your mind, and see that you are trusting what Christ did and that alone to save you. Christ died for your sins and arose from the grave three days later as proof that he paid the price completely. So now the question is, do you believe that? Will you trust in what Christ did? I pray that you do. Message. Free message, Osiris. Amen. Okay. Any questions? Uh, do you want to go ahead and cl close up in prayer and then turn the recording sure. off and then we can take questions? All right. Let's give me one second there. I somehow, uh... oh, there we go. Stop the share. Okay. All right. Father God, we'd just like to give thanks, uh, especially for your son uh, dying our death so you can give us your life. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to work through us, through your word in us, to share that message with the rest of the world and try to continue to live our lives in a way that expresses who we are in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen.